the interview room Muzzy checking in the times here How you all doing? Alright, let's begin Let's have a chat about the fact that I want to interview the best fighters in the world And that's that Had a lot of guests from everywhere All across the globe Fighters tell me How are we guys? Muzzy here from Muay Thai Interviews again uh, My next guest, he trains out a Double Dragon Martial Arts gym in the Sutherland Shire, Sydney he just made his uh, Muay Thai Pro debut uh, last month, making swift work of his opponent, winning by KO. Uh, he's making his Rebellion Roots debut uh, in Melbourne next week, and he also does his, runs his own podcast called Enter the Double Dragon. I'm joined by Hugh O'Donnell. How are you, buddy? Good, man. How are you? Oh, mate, just getting over this uh, man flu, but, you know, we'll all survive. The soldier on. Soldier on. Hugh, I've got to make a confession, mate. With a last name like O'Donnell... And me uh, living in, and working in WA with a quite a high Irish population, I was expecting to hear quite a uh, strong Irish voice. But if I was to close my eyes, I'd say your Aussie is anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, um, Dad's Irish, and my grandparents and aunties and uncles and cousins are Irish. But I, I've been here forever. I, I was born here. Yeah. Well, the uh, it, it hasn't got past the end. At least you've uh, you've got the Aussie accent, mate. So does your dad have an Aussie accent as well? Nah, dad sounds Irish as anything, but um, that's where it stops. I still got like the the ginger hair and stuff like that. So if I didn't speak, you could probably guess me as Irish. But yeah, once I open my mouth, it's all Aussie. If you have, if you if you're having a few beers, does uh, does your Irish accent come out at all? I wish. <laughs> I can put one on. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, mate. So um, yeah. So you made your 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 pro debut um last month and. Uh, yep. That was a, you got off to quite a good start, mate. There, KOing your opponent, making in what was it two rounds? Yeah, sort of around about the middle point of the the second round. I was actually did it with leg kicks for the most part. Got sort of two knockdowns, two eight counts with leg kicks, and then yeah, leg just completely gave. So I started working at it with the hands, and then yeah, referee had to jump in about a minute and a half into the second round, I think. Yeah. So how many how many fights did you have? Prior to that, so that was you call that that was your first pro one. How many how many yeah. fights had you had before that? Ah, uh, twenty. Twenty, but yeah. even though even though you you call yourself an amateur for twenty fights, how long were you having? The, was it just the first five fights that you've got to have padded? Padding. Well, here in New South Wales, we've got a bit of a funky system. So, like, I've had headgear on for nineteen of my fights. I think. Yeah. I think two of them I've been without headgear because like, I've been interstate but yeah I was a registered amateur for yeah 20 of my fights in um, New South Wales and that's all like no not full padding like yeah. I didn't have I've had fights at like nationals and stuff like that where I had to wear shin guards but I didn't start in shin guards I started in just headgear and elbow pads Yeah. so it's like yeah, the majority of my fights I had to wear the headgear but like it's a bit funny because you as far as the you know the Government is concerned; it's padded, but like you're not wearing shin guards. So if you're going to pad something, you pad the shins. Yeah. Um. And oh, what was I going to say? That's right. About the, you probably seen on Facebook, uh, in, particularly in WA, there's been a petition going around saying that they want to get rid of the headgear. Yeah. Um. What are your thoughts on that? And and what's what's like you being from New South Wales and you're trying to get heavily involved in the in the Muay Thai mm. scene over there? What, what what are your thoughts on it? And and where do you see the um, where do you see the headgear issue going with New South Wales? Do you think they'll, uh, in time, try and alleviate that as well? Oh, actually, I'm pretty sure we're in a pretty good spot with this in New South Wales. So I try not to... Like, there's a lot of complaints about the headgear and stuff like that. And, like, if you want to chuck fighters in headgear for their first five fights or whatever, that's, you know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I think once you get to the sort of... Um, the commercial shows, you know, and guys have had 10, 15 fights. Yeah, take the headgear off them. Like, and I think the thing with New South Wales is we've just got a bit of this system where, like, there's just a massive leap between amateur and professional. So if you're considered amateur, if you're not getting paid a fight purse, you've got to be wrapped up in the pads. Yeah. Whereas then from there, you just go straight into professional with nothing. So I think what New South Wales is... I'm pretty sure there are moves being made to do this pretty soon. I think there's going to be kind of a class system in yeah. New South Wales, and there'll be, like, uh, you'll have your, your novice real amateurs, and they'll be on the development days, which is 
kind of what we're doing for guys early fights now in a gym, kind of full ear from the padding. Yep. Then once you move on to one of the commercial shows, then you can take... I think maybe they'll still do elbow pads, which that makes sense to me, keep the B classes in the elbow pads, but they can take the headgear off. I think that's the system we're going to settle on. And I think there's a, I think that's pretty close to fruition at this point. I reckon <clears throat> get rid of the headgear. If anything, yes, no. if anything, make make the gloves bigger, sixteen yeah. or, or eighteen or twenty ounce, and if and if and maybe for your first three to five fights, no head kicks or something like that. Yeah, like, I mean, like, I think the rules should just be full tie rules, and you mm-hmm. can pad it as you want to pad it. But if you got guys in their early fights, like, if you really want to pad them, and that is, if you're putting pads on the fighters, you're trying to protect them. Yeah, like put shin guards on them then. Mm-hmm. Like if that's if your concern is safety, because like that's what they can smash themselves and each other up with. I don't think the head gut, the head gear, really does anything either. As far as like, like I've been clocked in the nog and wearing head gear plenty of times. I don't think it softens anything. Like as far as impact to yeah. your, your brain is concerned. So I think like like I saw someone say in one of these discussions the other day, it's like pad the weapon, not the target. Mm-hmm. And that made sense to me. Is like yeah, put big gloves on them if you want to, like, that's what they're doing at the moment with the development days is they wear cotton shin guards and big gloves yeah. awesome let them get in get a feel for it um, kind of pat it up but particularly once you get to you're going to a real kind of show where people are buying tickets and stuff like that yeah ditch the head gear I think anyway but yeah because how many times like if, you've, if you're going to a show and and you see like oh there's the first three fights are padded. Everyone will, apart from their friends, everyone will be like, "Oh, we don't have to get there that early. We you know we'll yeah. wait till the to the proper fights start, sort of thing." Yeah, there's just that aesthetic, I think. Like, and like a lot of the shows in New South Wales the last couple of years have been battling with declining ticket sales, and like whether or not it makes sense. You know, to people like to people in the industry, like there is that aesthetic thing to spectators, whereas like they view fights as kind of less significant when they're in headgear and stuff like that. And I think that does make a difference. Like, the crowd don't like the look of the headgear. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, and that being said, you have to make decisions based on the development of the fighters, not just what spectators think. But I think that's what that class system will do, is you can get the guys in full gear and headgear, similar to what you see at IFMA, on development day kind of C-class amateur fights. But once they've kind of found their feet in that format, then you can take them onto the the proper shows and and get rid of the headgear and sort of give just a more more of a big show feel, I guess. Um, and also, someone else I, I had a good idea is because I mean I've said this before and I'll say it again, but how many times do you see people get punched in the head or whatever, and the headgear moves and they're yeah. sitting there trying to so they can see and other guy or, or, or woman could have thrown two, three, four punches, you know, and the rest got to stop oh, it. Okay. But I reckon they um get different, different, uh, they're the wrong headgears. I reckon they should use like the, you know, the rugby union ones, like the Canterbury yeah. ones, the ones that just <laughs> sit flat and just cut straight over your head. And they, they don't really move that much and they don't obstruct your, well, you'd you hope not anyway. Um, But what do you, would, would you be opposed uh, for that or no? I think that's what it comes back to is like I think, especially if you're wearing a headgear like that, that like it wouldn't do anything. So rather than just coming up with a different kind of headgear that suits better but has no actual effect, yeah, just use the headgear. Like instead of trying to just like work it in a way that like yeah, this headgear is a little bit better. It's really small. Like because like the fighters in New South Wales, like I remember looking at pictures of guys back in the day. They used to wear footy headgear. Yeah. Oh, it's like they change the rules to be like, no, you have to wear like a quarter, sort of more of a, I guess, a boxing head gear, not yeah. close face. Though. So it's like rather than just kind of coming up with ways to cheat the headgear system, you know, wear a smaller headgear that really isn't like wearing headgear, yeah. you're better off just going, yeah, the headgear's doing no good, so let's ditch it. Ditch it. Bigger but it's like, I don't think it's, let's like, say if you've got a system where, like, you probably know more about how it is in WA than I do. I was under the impression you just have to have X number of fights wearing pads and then you can take them off. Is that how it works there? I think so. Don't. Yeah. I'd have to, I think I'd have to check that. Yeah. I think if that's the case, just bang out your head gear fights and then you never have to think about it again. Like I don't think you have to complain too much about pads in fights, but here in New South Wales, you've got guys where they get to about 
the 10 fight mark a lot of the time. And your options are continue to fight in headgear or make the big leap to the pros. Yeah. And it's not the best for development because, you know, like, you see it a lot. Like, people can go pro too early and then, like, you know, you lose your first couple of pro fights, maybe get hurt, you fight people who are too experienced. And then, like, it's a big leap to make just on the basis of I don't want to wear headgear. Yeah. So I think, well, I think we are close to having a system in New South Wales that will recognise B-class amateurs. So don't have to worry about paying everyone a purse or anything like that, but they can ditch their headgear and then just fight on the shows. There's, um, funny you say that, because there was a guy, um, I won't say names or anything, but I met him in Thailand. Uh, he's from America, and he's from Florida. And I watched a couple of his fights. Like, he, he was actually a pretty good fighter, you know. I think he's had, like, you know, 15... Yeah. 15 to 20 fights and it was a pretty good fight I'm more, more into his like spinning shit but <laughs> but it was it was a good fight nonetheless and um, I watched him a couple of his video uh, show, show videos on um, Facebook and they were fighting for, for a belt and then I looked and he's coming off wearing shin guards and headgear and I was like I was like are you fighting I'm like why are you guys fighting for a well, one, why are you fighting in shin pads anyway? Because you've had like 15 to 20 fights. And two, if you're fighting for a title, why are these fighting in shin uh, I just, that just blew my mind, man. And I was just yeah. like, fuck, if you're going to fight for a belt, I don't care what sanctioning body or country you're in, you should not wear any protective, apart from your box and your mouth guard, you should yeah. not wear any, because it just takes away from the whole thing. It's like, yeah, you want a title, but it's like, yeah, mate, you, you want it in headgear and, and shin pads. Exactly like, right. Who yeah. does that? And that's kind of the system we have in New South Wales. Is like obviously with the um, with Muay Thai Australia, you've got like the MTA titles, kind of the B class or the amateur title. Then the WMC belts are for the pros. But here in New South Wales, when guys are getting to level to fight for MTA titles, yeah, they have to wear them in headgear. And I think that's well, they have to win them in in headgear. And I think that's one of the better arguments for getting rid of it. Is that like if you're at that like because the guys are, are, are at the experience level to fight for these Muay Thai Australia titles, but yeah. the fights have to be put on in headgear just because they're amateur fights. I don't think that's yeah getting a bit like when you get into getting the B class system. If you are winning fighting for a title and, and and things like that, yeah, it should be in a proper unpadded format. It just sort of um, it just takes away from it. I think like it's like you want a belt, but who wants to see someone standing there with a belt around their waist in chin pads and head guard, you know? It makes you question the kind of meaning of the title. But, like, it's like you're in New South Wales, man. You go to any of the... Not any of the shows. There's a good sanction. But you go to any of the shows in some of the other sanctions. And, you know, like, every third fight is for a title. Like, yeah. It's just, like, the only prerequisite for fighting for a title in New South Wales is, like have three fights or something like it's just everything and it's just so stupid like you have bang average fighters that are you know their instagram says three time australian champion two time south pacific champion blah 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 champion and it's like you know they've had eight fights and they've never fought someone who's more than half an hour away from home it's like you know and like i'm in i've won these titles as well like i have a heap of them in my room like but it's i didn't pick that i was fighting for title fights, it would just be like, you know, we'd look for a fight. And I wanted to stay really active as an amateur. And if you wanted to be active, like the way it works in New South Wales is like, if you want to be active and if you want to fight five round fights, like we'll say, yeah, can you get us a five rounder? And the promoter will go, oh, you want a title fight? Okay. So no. I didn't ask that. I didn't ask for a title. I asked for a five round fight. Which is, is what Muay Thai is. Which is what Muay Thai is, exactly right. Yeah. So it's like, you know, like, they just do, all right, you're fighting another bloke from Sydney, that's going to be the South Pacific title. So, whatever, man. Like, <laughs> Just get me the fight, all right? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Maybe you won't. And do you also think, um, going back to the padding and stuff, I wanted to ask your opinion on, like, with the, the body the body padding, um, I think wearing that takes away from, uh, when I say the authenticity of Muay Thai, obviously I don't mean just the cosmetic look, but because... I've seen it, and so many people do it as well, where they're wearing the body pads, and when they clinch, first of all, they can't clinch properly. Yeah. And, sec- and second of all, obviously, cl- clinching the knees to the to your midsections are what scores, but because there's no padding on your thighs, people just go- aim for the cork, t- t- to cork your thigh, which yeah. 
which is it's not a bad idea because there's no padding there and you're going to try and you know uh, uh, what's the word not cripple but uh, slow your opponent down but yeah. because because you'll see in clinches people they will they will go to the thighs but predominantly they go to the midsection because that's where it scores but whereas having those that big bloody chest guard on it, yeah. it, it takes away from it and people people will try and, and find other ways I think like because I can definitely understand that but I think like cause we've got guys like the way it's sort of working around here at the moment is like guys will have their first few fights like their real amateur fights on development days like which is like we were saying in a gym rather than in like uh, an actual venue and they wear the full pads and I think the best argument for putting people in those pads is that sort of the highest uh, level of truly amateur Muay Thai in the world is the IFMA World Championships. Yeah. And they wear those pads there. So when we've got guys fighting as amateurs, it's worthwhile letting them build experience in that format. So they can work through, because we have state championships now and national championships and up in that format. I think putting a grassroots level of IFMA format Muay Thai is a good idea. Like they're doing, I know they're doing that a lot in the US. And the other thing with that is, I think as I've started to develop sort of, I guess, a keener eye for Thai boxing, I actually quite like watching the guys fighting pads because I like the way that, you know, you talk about sort of you can just wear knees to the midsection and, and middle kicks and stuff that you can't wear in shin guards. But where, if you choose to wear them, you're still getting scored on. So mm. it becomes a little bit more of like a point scoring chess match almost like you have to smartly score because you can't just rely purely on just blasting through with the damage of your technique your technique has to kind of be on point to score right and then I think that's good for the guys development because it means that look a lot of the time I think earlier on guys would have their first fights completely unpadded yeah. and then just sort of the the stronger and, and the more powerful better athlete would like more often than not just win yeah. whereas once you wrap the guys in pads and you sort of just take away the actual damage of every individual strike the guy who can play the points game better wins and I think that's an important skill to gain early in your career and we're seeing that a lot like like you know you've seen early amateur fights even like since I've been involved guys used to just have their first ever in ring experience completely unpadded and it'd be shocking like yeah. it would just be <laughs> It's not like a knock on anyone who does it. No one looks good in their first fight, really. Yeah. It's getting a lot better, I bet, like, that's what first fights are for. Yeah. But guys will just smash their shins up and just really try to run through each other, whereas once you've got the pads on, like, hey, guys don't smash their shins up on the first kick. They can learn to sort of place the kicks and make a couple of mistakes. But also, you see them really earlier in their careers starting to think about point scoring over the course of the, the fight. And that's where, like, I've been really enjoying the the novice stuff in New South Wales, the development days, just looking at how gyms are really preparing their fighters for the format, mm. like really specifically preparing. Like, yeah, I, I've been liking it. I don't mind the chess guard and stuff. Like, obviously, it's it's for a certain type of fight, like a, a, a novice fight or, or a tournament format fight. But I also like that, um, like, when I have boys on the development days, if they got matched and there's one other guy at their weight that didn't get a match for the day, they can maybe go a couple of times, yeah. even just in their second or third fight. Like, oh, I think that's the best for development. Like, I tend to tell the guys, like, be ready to go twice mm. on the day because if they come and say, oh, we've got another boy who will take a fight, would you have it? Best experience to just get in there two fights one day, like twice the experience you signed up for. Like, and, oh, experience is everything, eh? And uh, I think you, uh, you hit the nail on the head there with... Um um, like with the development days and stuff, I think when you do see people having their first couple of fights, it does look a lot better than what it was in the old days where you can... 100%. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are you, you will see sometimes... You will still see two people and as soon as the bell just goes, they just look like cats fucking... Yeah, of course. each other. But you can see that a lot of people, they're actually trying to think about what they do so they will try and have that even though you're nervous as hell they will start yeah. still try and have that calm composure and try and look and, and pick their shots yeah and like we had a boy on like had his first fight um Luke's the development day and he fought one of um Andrew's boys from PTJ and this was slick like 
both boys were real technical, mm. measured. No one just like ran out of the gate just trying to brawl. Like they play, they it was tight boxing. It was yeah. not like, and it was just it was beautiful to watch. And that's I think really telling of where Muay Thai is going in Australia wide, but especially here in New South Wales, which has been sort of one of the states of Australia that's been a little bit behind. I think. Mm. But yeah, I think things are on the up and up for sure, and, and the padded fights have been helping. Yep, mate. And one thing I wanted to uh, ask you about, you, you mentioned earlier on um, um, in New South Wales there are declining uh, ticket sales uh, for Muay Thai events. Yeah. What do you think that's attributed to, and how do you think we you can um, get more people coming to your shows? Um, I think it's a few things. Like, I think sometimes... With, like, I think the sanctioning system in New South Wales is quite convoluted. Like, there's a bunch of sanctions that are all pumping out titles, and like, you've got shows that, like, sometimes people they just want to go and watch some Muay Thai, and they're not interested in shows that are doing Muay Thai and K1 and MMA and boxing. Like, because you're selling people a mixed bag, but if you only want to go watch one thing. A mixed bag's not interesting. Hmm. I think there's a bit of that. And, like, there's always going to be a little bit of that politics of certain pools of people don't like certain sanctions and things like that for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of, like, like, there's a couple of shows in New South Wales now that are really tr- starting to get ahead in doing something different with their marketing and stuff like that. And it's, like, there's a good network of shows in the Muay Thai Australia sanction. Um, Andrew Parnham, Siam to Sydney, uh, my trainers, Shane and Rowan's, Fire in the Shire, Lewis Regis and Eduardo's, uh, they bring Yokao in. Yeah. And if you look at all these shows, they're quite upscale almost. Like when one of those, they don't try to do a million shows a year. They just do a couple each, spread them out nicely. And when they're on, you know, the card feels significant. There's a good number of pro fights. Um, especially on like uh, Yokao and Fire in the Shire. Like Andy shows a little bit more low key. Yeah. Like, you know, they're a little bit sort of uh, a bit, bit bells and whistles, like lights, camera type shows. But I think the other issue with ticket sales is there's not really pro shows in New South Wales. Like, when you go to other states, if there's a pro show, there's a full card of professional fights. Like, a you know, um, a bunch of pro fights are on. Whereas in New South Wales, some promoters have taken the piss a little bit when they put on a what they'd call a pro am show. It's one pro fight at the top and twenty amateur fights. Yeah. And what they're trying to do is sell you a ridiculous number of fights, so you're in there till one in the morning. Um, and the, you know they put on twenty fights, twenty amateur fights. That's you know, maybe it's not twenty, maybe it's fifteen. So. Yeah. That's that's thirty fighters. If they all sell five tickets each, promoters golden. So you're sitting there like so. By the time the pro fight comes, like. Say so if you're there to watch an amateur mate, you had to wait until midnight to watch him, and there's still pros to come. You're like, oh, I've got training in the morning, whatever. Let's just get out of here. Yeah. Whereas like, when you get a proper pro show that's got a full pro card, it tries to give you a reason to go and watch the card, even if maybe your friends aren't fighting. Because mm. I do think that's another problem with ticket sales in New South Wales is, and it comes back to a wider issue. Like I think, because I talk to a lot of people in Muay Thai, and me. Personally, like, I really want Muay Thai to grow. Like, I want to help it grow here in Australia and in New South Wales. And I think, like, when I talk to, say, there's an awesome card, like, um, Andrew and Siam Sydney always put on an awesome pro card. And I'll say to someone, Are you going? He goes, Oh, man, I want to. The card is so good, but I don't have anyone from my gym fighting. Mm-hmm. It's like, if you know the card is good and you want to go see it, it doesn't matter. Like, just be a, be a Thai boxing fan. Yeah. And I always go to the show. Like if I, like, I don't go to every show. I don't have to, <laughs> the time or the money yeah. to go to a show every Friday and Saturday because there's a lot of shows. Yeah. When I see one that I'm like, yes, that is a show that is worth the price of a ticket, I don't care if I personally know someone who's fighting. I just go. I go and watch Muay <laughs> Thai. That's how it should be, I think. People want to see, like, say people say, I want to see Muay Thai grow. And their idea of helping it grow is just fighting when it's time to fight and that's not really you supporting Muay Thai that's Muay Thai supporting you that's mm-hmm. a matchmaker going and getting you a fight 
matching you with someone else, giving you a spot on their card. You're just showing up and doing what you like to do. That's not really like, yeah, you are supporting Muay Thai by being present on the show, but supporting Muay Thai is not just fighting when it's your turn to fight. It's buying tickets when you have the means and going and being a spectator. It's setting up chairs at development days and giving your coaches a hand. It's helping out with teaching and educating people on how to score. So I think that contributes to the decline in ticket sales in that people want to just go in, watch their friend and go home. And maybe that comes back to is like there can be too many shows with heaps and heaps of fights that people can't invest and support mm-hmm. the show. So I think it's just about like people need to just get behind the shows that are worth getting behind and get a ticket and enjoy because if you really love Muay Thai, what's wrong with just you know putting your hard earned towards a ticket and giving yourself a good night out, really? I think that's where ticket sales go up is where people you know, support it when they can support it. Obviously, sometimes you just can't go, but I always try to get out to every show that's good. Really. People say, people like, say like, oh, here we go, oh, here we go. a little reverb from, from the internet. The internet. <laughs> Just, just there we go. Um, yeah, because people say, oh, it's like you know, 40, 50, 50, 60 bucks for a ticket. Yeah, but it's going to go for you know three, four hours. And you know, if you go to the pub with your mates, you're going to yeah. spend like minimum hundred bucks if you, if you live in Perth anyway, because they're like eleven, twelve dollar pints. So, <laughs> so what's what's forty, fifty, sixty bucks? You know. Yeah, and look, it is expensive to go to a show in New South Wales, and I I did that. And like, I'm a uni student. Like, sometimes I just. Um, it's too strapped for cash to go, but I think, yeah, you, you, you're on the right track there, is that where people like, most people who say they can't afford it, it's not that they can't afford it, they just would rather not go. Like, like see, kind of the main ticket price in New South Wales at the moment is about $75, mm-hmm. and like, that's a lot of money to go out and watch, and I get it, and sometimes you just can't do it, but I think if you can, you should. Like, if you're interested, like, if you... You know, especially if you're getting to the point where you're getting a little bit of a kickback from tickets when it's your turn to fight. So that's what goes around and comes around. Yeah. Support Muay Thai and Muay Thai will support you, I think. I think I, I think people also, in, in relation to ticket prices, say like, you know, you go to, you, you see a rebellion and that's a stacked card. You know, mm. there's like 12, 13, 14 fights Sai so puts on, you know, and say the, the general admin, I think the minimum ticket's like, you know, 60, 65 bucks. Yeah. And you, and you see the card that he's got on and then you go in to see a smaller show and it's like the same price but there's yes. like half the amount of fights and it's like, well, am I really getting value for dollar here? You know what I well, mean? Well, that's the thing as well, like coming back to the thing in New South Wales with like Pro-Am shows where like the ticket prices in New South Wales across every show, they tend to stay the same because well, basically like if someone starts charging more for their ticket then every other show just goes, oh, we can charge that much, and they charge that much too, which is like, that's business. But yeah, what we're seeing in New South Wales is every show costs the same, but some shows have seven pro fights and some shows have one. So it's like, you've got to look at that and go, if you guys are charging the same, I understand the guy who's got to pay 14 professional fighters. The guy who's got to pay two, why does his show cost the same? You know what I mean? So I think that's really the issue is that like, people really like there are shows that are just ringing spectators out for everything that they can and but it'll be their own demise because it's those shows that you go to and you look around in the crowd and there's 20 people there and you go this promoter's gonna have a tough time with this one i hope he has some good sponsors yeah i actually um i interviewed um kingy um about yeah. promotion and stuff and he he made a really really good point um uh, for those listening who don't know what I'm talking about, Adam King, um, tag, team. tag team championship. And he, he made a really good point um, with, say, like, if you've got a fighter and say you, there's 500 tickets for the venue and he sells mm. 300 of them, even though he may not be your best fighter, you're better off putting him further up the bill because yes. a lot of these people that are coming to the fight shows, they're not like you and I that'll stand there and, and, and watch the whole thing. They're just going to support their mates, and then once their yeah. mates fight, it's see you later. And sometimes, I'm sure you would have been to some fight shows where there's heaps of people at the start, they come and see their mates, and then you look at the last main event, and it's half empty. No idea, yeah. So, you you know, as a promoter, you'd be better off... If, if someone sells a lot of tickets, even though they may not be your A-class fighter, you're better off putting them further up the bill because you're going to have the 
his supporters or her supporters there for longer. Yeah, and then if you keep those supporters in, like maybe you've got a real A class fight just above that, mm. but it's not a big ticket selling fight. It's just a fight that is just a really good match, good technical match. Maybe you keep those supporters in the house by putting that big seller up the card, then you make some fans for for the guy who's really got the skill and stuff like that. So, I think matchmaking and putting a show together is an art in that regard. Mm-hmm. Like you have to kind of try to accommodate the sort of fan base of the people who sell a lot of tickets that are maybe slightly lower in actual experience and then try at the same time to introduce the people who have bought the tickets to other people because then, you know, these people that are willing to spend tickets to support their mates, they're probably going to come to a few shows and then they'll start to recognise other names and things like that and that's how you build a sport. That's how you build stars and things like that is you find a way to get people in first and foremost and that can often be a pretty inexperienced amateur fighter that's got heaps of friends and family and heaps of mates, and then you try to organise the card in a way that you can show these people something new, and show them really good, talented fighters and stuff like that. And yeah, I think that's kind of the balance for promoters. And also, uh, liquor licence would be a big one because uh, let's face it, how many times have you have you had a few beers and you're like, oh, I'm going to go after this fight or I'm going to go after this beer, and then you see the next fight and you're having a few beers and they're going down nice and you think, oh, this fight isn't actually too bad. I might stay for this one and then you have another beer and, oh, I might stay for the next one. Um, yeah, that's it. You've got to give people a night out. That's it. Like The thing with shows is like, you can kind of go one or two ways with it in that you can really try to appeal to the Muay Thai purists and try to give them really good matches that kind of rely on their own research and things like that. That's a good way to do it. That's a great way to do it. But the reality is there isn't that many purist Muay Thai fans. Like, There's a growing number, but it's still a niche. So you have to try to also get people on the card that just frankly get people through the door. And that's the balance. Because you don't want to also... It's not sustainable to kind of build a show around a couple of people that have had two fights each that just happen to sell 100 tickets because you don't know if they'll ever fight again. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's how a lot of these big ticket sellers are. So you have to, I think, establish a presence as a show that puts on real, credible, authentic Muay Thai matches, but also a show that, yeah, just gives a platform to people who can sell tickets because in that situation, everyone wins. But even, I, I reckon, maybe even go back to a bit of the old school, um, not, not promoting, but like, getting your name out there like well, you're probably not allowed to do it these days because with bloody government and, yeah. and all these you're not allowed to do this but you remember back when I was a teenager I'd drive past you know all the telegraph poles you know when you're 18, 19, 20 going to your clubs that have all the flyers wrapped around all the telegraph poles like yeah. every single long Victoria Road and, and all the main streets where everyone's going to be you'd have people standing out in your local shopping centres or in the city handing out flyers going, you know, come to this event, come to this event. And sure, maybe if you hand out, you know, a hundred, not all, maybe one out of a hundred will come, but at least, yeah. you know, you're going to get your, your your name and your brand out there out there a bit more, I reckon, sometimes. But, I mean, that that's all time-consuming. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, have, you know, just don't have the time these days or, you know, employ your bloody your nephew or your nieces, so I'll give you 10 bucks an hour just to stand there and just to hand out flies and just have someone stand there and check on and make sure they're all right. Yeah, and I think it comes back to as well as like one of the issues as well with maybe some of the shows not doing as well is whether you want to stand there and then hand out flyers or pin stuff up or, or whatever, it's all just being proactive about marketing your show. Like it's mm. just become about... I'll put on heaps of amateur fights. I don't have to pay any purses and they'll all sell a few tickets each and I'm golden. I don't have to do anything. Yeah. And I think it's really, if you want to grow your, your own profile, it's on you as a fighter to market yourself. But yeah. a promoter is a promoter, someone who promotes. So there has to be a bit of work from both sides. And when you've got fighters that are keen to kind of put themselves out there and promoters that are working to get new eyes on their show, that's where you get growth. How do you think, do you reckon Muay Thai needs to go get back on um, like international and, and mainstream TV to to get more uh, audiences? And I'm not just talking about the people that follow and uh, uh, in that like I'm um, just like your, you know, your, your everyday bobs and ands. I think really like I hear a lot of like, 
people say, oh, Muay Thai needs to be back on Fox still, needs to be back on Fox still. Because, like, like, Muay Thai really did have kind of a, a, a heyday in Australia, and that was the Fox Sports era, where yeah. um, sort of Evolution and, and Nisa Fury was on, on Foxtel as well. But I think, for the most part, TV's kind of dead. I don't think I think TV is the past rather than the future. I think one of the biggest things that's happened to Muay Thai that we're starting to see around now is, is one championship, the Super Series. I think just something like that where you're getting kind of that base level of um, people who want to watch MMA because obviously MMA has a big fan base and you're just slotting real Muay Thai fights in amongst that yeah. and just distributing it entirely for free. Like I think that's... Well, I think for a long time, in a global sense, like a big platform for Muay Thai didn't really exist. Yeah. And that's what one championship can be. It can be something for... And the opportunities are being created. We've seen a few others go over there and, and get to fight. That's mm -hmm. a massive audience that you can show yourself to. And that's sort of just going to kind of get the wheels turning. in that Because I'm seeing people like... When I just scroll through my Facebook, I do start to see people who maybe weren't... Uh, familiar with a lot of Muay Thai or there's kickboxing on there as well kickboxing school too yep. seeing this and going man I was just watching the MMA but that was awesome like there's some yeah. it's a massive knockouts that's really I think what we've needed for a while is just something to because people so often kind of they get just frustrated with like you know Muay Thai is just like MMA with no ground game like people should watch it and it's like you don't have to think of it as like we need to just convert MMA fans because MMA fans want to watch MMA. Like we need mm. to make Muay Thai fans, and I think one has kind of got that balance where they'll put on some MMA fights, and maybe you're there for the MMA, and they might make a Muay Thai fan out of you there, rather than just trying to market. Because for a long time, even like local shows, the marketing was kind of like this show is kind of like MMA. You should come watch it, and it's mm. like it's not really the right idea because Muay Thai has such a distinct culture of its own that when you start to just go, you know. Um, MMA with no ground game, it becomes watered down with Thai. It's not rather than just trying to convince people that they're watching sort of like another kind of MMA, which is not what it is, try to just show people Muay Thai and show people as it is. And I think that's why Rebellion's been so successful. Mm. Is because they didn't try to take anything away. They just gave a platform to real, authentic Muay Thai, beautiful stylists. They leave all the it's it's a it's a commercial kind of show but they leave all of the the traditional elements in and that's what people like because once you start to pull things away to make it a little bit more user friendly if you will the fans you had like the existing Muay Thai fans don't want to watch and then you're left clutching at straws just trying to pull MMA fans in they want to watch MMA give people give the Muay Thai fans what they want to see and let them bring people with them and things like that and then just grow Muay Thai don't try to just you know, push it over towards MMA and try to grab the fan base. Of course, a lot of the people that you're going to make Muay Thai fans out of, they will be MMA fans, and that's fine. But they're not just going to become MMA fans that watch the odd Muay Thai fans. Ideally, they'll become Muay Thai fans as well. And I think that's important is just growing combat sports. Just combat sports. And that's like, one, they put it all under one umbrella. Like, yeah, one. <laughs> you can watch the MMA. And like that's like what I've been, because I've been really watching the one. I've been loving it. Um for the Super Series, and then maybe I'll, because I don't watch, well, I watch some MMA, but not as much, I used to watch it a fair bit, but I've just sort of lost interest, but then, yeah. they'll see an MMA fight in between the Muay Thai fights, and I'll watch that, and I think it works both ways, like you bring people from various disciplines in, and you sit down, you watch a mixed show, and it's good. And I think um, you, you were right as well, like the way that one have got their platform, um, they've got that app, and it's free to watch. Yeah. I, I used to, like, before I started doing these Muay Thai interviews and stuff, I used to watch a lot of... I mean, I always used to watch Muay Thai, but I used to watch a lot of MMA and USC and that sort of stuff. And I had a subscription. And once I started doing these Muay Thai interviews, I was like, well, I'm not really watching that much mm. UFC or as much as what I was because I'm watching more Muay Thai and trying to, you know, uh, focus on, on people and, and Muay Thai and, and all that sort of stuff. So I ended up getting rid of my subscription because I was like, what am I going to pay 150 bucks yeah. a, a year for where there's one... That it's free so even if you don't really follow MMA but you follow uh, Muay Thai or, or vice versa you're probably still going to sit there and watch the other fights anyway because A you don't have to pay for it so it's not costing you a thing and 
yeah, that's, that's it's a basically a win-win situation. It's a win-win for one because they're getting all the viewers, and it's a win-win for you because you're getting a bloody good show and it's free of charge that you don't have yeah, to pay I'm for. Yeah, I'm loving what absolutely loving it like some of those super series fights have just been unreal and the names that they're pulling in like it's one of the first examples of an international like a show trying to really build an international multi platform where the people behind it really know who to sh- who the top end fighters are like mm. what's got the biggest actual muay thai commodity before this is probably lion fight and they they brought in some good ties and stuff like that, but the roster that they built, it wasn't like like you weren't watching like a lot of the time they'd be like, oh, we're bringing in you know this Thai champion, and then it'd be like people who actually watch Thailand Muay Thai would go, that's not really like a Thai a champion like guy, or it's like oh, we're bringing in a Thai champion who's had eighty fights, and oh yeah, who are you fighting for a belt? Oh yeah, some Yankee dude that's had fifteen fights. It's like yeah, come on, man. Yeah, I mean, like, even like what they did to loads of all that time, ended up fighting yeah. <laughs> an MMA guy with, like, six fights or something. That had <coughs> so, like, one of putting on, they're putting on guys, like, you know, they had Mung Tai the other week. Um, they signed your leg pair, but he didn't get to fight. Yeah. Um, patched arm. Um, Salmon uh, Pet fought last night. Salmon Pet fought last night. That was awesome. I was just watching that um, before we started chatting, actually. Like, and they're giving them real matchups. Like, you know, yeah. just well, that was my worry when I like my initial reaction when I saw they were doing it was like excited, but then I was also like, are we just gonna start watching squash matches? And yeah. I think the matchups are pretty fair. Yeah. Like even Lordzilla, they gave him that sock T, and he gave him a really hard fight that mm. maybe could have gone the other way the first time. Then they did the rematch. You know that like it's real matchmaking and stuff like that as well. Like I think that's massive, and I think people. I think some people were a little bit skeptical, like the real purists, about Muay Thai going down on a show that's an MMA show. But I, I just don't think you can be too choosy. I think their their mission is in the right place and things like that. And I don't yeah. think they're watering down the product teeth. And I think that's something that everyone should sort of get behind because if that's like watch Muay Thai at a local level blow up when there's something people can aspire to. Like MMA's um, not to always talk about, like, I think the conversation is, is pretty overdone about, you know, Muay Thai comparing to growth to MMA. Every young MMA fighter wants to get to the UFC. That's that's what they want to do, whereas Muay Thai didn't really have, like, if you really wanted to test yourself against the best, like, you could take yourself to Thailand, mm-hmm. and you could try to do a stint there, but there was never, like, the big show, you know what I mean? Like, and I think one is going to be really good for that, and, like, supporting shows, you know, like, Muay Thai Grand Prix is very good. Rebellion here in Australia is good. There are big platforms to fight now. And yeah. I think for the next generation of guys that are coming in, that's going to be massive. Yeah, definitely, mate. Definitely, definitely. Um, and speaking of Rebellion, mate, uh, next week you making your Roots debut um, on the undercard of yep. Ramesh versus Barry Oliver, the third good, trilogy uh, fight. Correct. So t- tell, us, tell us about um, how your training's been going, mate. You're, you're a week out from that. Yeah, week out now or, or eight days since the Sunday show. Um, training's been really good as always. Like I've been, um, you know, like especially for my last kind of two fights, like I really zoned in on like my um, my coaches are um, Shane Greenwood and Rowan Sangster, and um, Rowan is uh, probably the more hands-on. Like they're both fight coaches, but for guys at the fighter level, Rowan is does more of the actual technical stuff, yep. where Shane's the guy who he, like he helps out with the technical stuff too, but he, um, he's the guy who's sort of running things in terms of the matchmaking and stuff like that, but he also does all of our um, strength and conditioning, and we've really got pretty, like I always focus a lot on strength and conditioning like from the very start of my career, but Shane's just like, he's such a student, like he's really getting always up, upskilling himself and and educating himself more and more, and we switched on a lot with not just the strength and conditioning I do as part of my main training regime, but my extras. Like, because for me, like, I'm just a worker. Like, I always want to do more. A lot of fighters are the same. So when left to my own devices, I probably do stuff that's not that bad. Like, I'll just go take myself for long runs all the time. If I got a spare hour, I'll just go hit the road because it's the easiest thing to do. Just go out and run, like, and that's the easiest work. But Shane's really switched it on with, you know, this day you're going to go sprint and this day you're going to do interval sets of this pace. I wear a heart rate monitor and it's all very 
ants and things like that, but also doing different kinds of strength work. Shane takes me through uh, like stuff that I'm too stupid to understand, but just pick that up the way that I tell you to do it. You know, like, <laughs> like he's really got it all mapped out, and I'm starting. Like I feel like you know I always want to be developing as a fighter, and I always felt like I develop well, and because I'm quite mindful of my technique, I I know what I'm working on all the time. I'm never just going through the motions of training. Yeah, but like it's really starting to feel like I am developing so much as an athlete, purely as an athlete, that I have like this bigger kind of, I can progress quicker with my technique because of the the athletic gains that I make and yeah, I really feel like I train truly like a professional, like a professional athlete and which is the way it should be as a professional. I don't think I actually asked you this question, it's the one question that I ask everyone, how did you find Muay Thai? It's kind of like, I just started to... Like, I was never, I always liked sport. I liked the idea of sport. But I just needed to find the sport. <laughs> like, it's, I like sport, but I didn't really like any individual sport, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. like I, I played a bit of soccer and stuff like that as a kid. But, like, not a lot, like one season at a time sort of stuff. But, like, I liked the idea of being a part of a sport. Mm-hmm. And I just, when I was 13 or so, just really developed an interest in combat sports generally. And I think... Probably more of that was like MMA type stuff, like the UFC, just because that's what was in front of me. So I joined the gym. Um, Double Dragon was the one I'd heard about it. Like it's pretty well known. Uh, Mix Beings, who started the gym, he's very well known, um, especially around Southern Shire, because so many people have been through the doors over the years. So I'd heard a bit about it, and I thought I'd go check it out. And um, I joined uh, Chain Green's kids class. But once I spent a bit more time in the gym, and I started to get more educated to various comments. Well, that's where I found Muay Thai. And, like, nothing really... Like, as soon as I kind of... St- Look, when I was training, because I've done a little bit of jiu-jitsu and stuff as well, um, just because I wanted to try it all, sort of. But, one, like, the stand-up fighting element of it interested me a lot more. But also, um, like, once I really started to see elite-level Muay Thai, like, I was just hooked. Like, just nothing resonated with me like that did. Like, and the way the ties train and fight and things like that, I just started to obsess. Yeah. Like, I just, like, I, always, like, I had a casual interest in MMA, and maybe that's what I saw that sort of wanted me, made me want to start training. But once I saw Muay Thai, like, it just became, like, I eat, sleep, and breathe it now. Like, I love Muay Thai. It's everything, like, I spend all, like, I go to work for the day. I get up and do a little bit of training in the morning, go to work, and then I spend pretty much every other waking hour of the day in the gym. I just go home, put some food away, and go to sleep. Like, like it's just became everything. And then I got to like, my coaches just gave me because at the time, I think what sort of put me onto Muay Thai is my coach Rowan was still fighting professionally then. Yep. And um, I actually think Rowan's probably like for his era, like really one of the the more underrated Muay Thai fighters of the day. Like he had some cracker fights. Like he was he, back in the days to read the um, the IK rankings. Yeah, so that yeah. I'd go buy a magazine like Roland was ranked in those, and um, yeah. So him fighting Muay Thai, that's what showed that to me. And like Ron just like because it was a good time to get involved because he was my coach, but he was also fighting actively as well. So not only would he teach me, I'd get to see him train, and he trained like an animal. Like he had just such a crazy work ethic, and I think a lot of people, I really try to demonstrate a very strong work ethic. I think that's where I kind of got that from yeah. so like yeah just seeing that like as soon as I saw Connor just like rowing training and fighting like I just wanted to be him basically <laughs> like That's I fair just fair yeah like, I just wanted to do what he did and then like the more I got into it the more I started to educate myself I was just like just fell in love with Muita. That's good, That's good. You, you become, you become the, the, the sorry yeah all good yeah, you become the people you hang around with. Uh, you try and you want to be like them, so it's good that you're surrounding yourself with positive role models. Yeah, hundred percent. Going the other way. And at the age I got into it, like it's the best time for me to have been around them because they took such good care of me. Like they gave. Like I think the the introduction that you get to this sport is so important because someone mm. who would have gone on to be would go on to be maybe a great fighter, might only last three lessons if their coach is just an asshole. Yeah. So, like, my coaches were so good, like, so 
they took their time, they were patient, and like they really wanted. But they also wanted me to explore and develop my style. Like I think, and that's like change world. Like they let me just. I'd be like. 15 years old and they'd be going out to a fight show and they just let me tag along and I was just some irritating little kid but like I would have never got to see these shows if you know they didn't show me and bring me in like I think really where I fell in love with Muay Thai was when I started to like um uh the early uh Real Hero shows in Sydney like Andrew shows I got to go to a couple of those and and the level of shows that I was getting to see then like I went to one of the early ones. It was like Sing Payak would be on there, and like um, Frankie Georgie, and That's the first one. Yeah, some of the real the real veterans and stuff like that. Like and like to get to see Muay Thai at that level, it just in my, like my own backyard in Sydney. That that's what made me go. Like, and just getting to experience. Like, I went to one of the real hero shows. I remember one of the early ones, and it was it was very it was Thai style in the sense that it was just on a basketball court because they did the real. You know, glitz and glamour, real hero show first. That did yep. Toby versus Superbon, and that was a great, a, amazing show that maybe Sydney wasn't really ready to receive yet. Like it was, it was it's too much. Like Sydney didn't deserve it, I think, because that show was unbelievable. And then they did sort of the the downsize thing, and, and it would just be at um, like you know, just a multi-purpose sports center, and you'd sit and see. But it was when I got to not just experience that elite level of Muay Thai watching, but also just be able to turn around and see the guys warming up. And that was my first kind of experience because we didn't have heaps of fighters at our gym for a while. Like We have an active fight team now, but then we didn't. So that was kind of my first introduction to get up, up close with it. And like, um, yeah, that going to those real heroes is what really made me turn me on to like, what Muay Thai really is. And that's what makes me think now when I go to a show, that's what a show should be. It should show someone like, wow, this is something I've never seen before. You know, it's 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 real Muay Thai. And, and, and that's how you make fans of sport. That's what made a fan of me. It's, it's my life now. When you when you just said that you didn't have a lot of fight, fighters at your gym for a while, um, I'm guessing, but you were a fighter. What would you guys do, like, for sparring, that sort of thing? Do you just spar amongst yourself? Did you just have to go and do a lot of, um, like, sparring with other gyms and that sort of thing? Well, it's kind of like for a while at um, our gym, like is our gym, like it's it's come sort of in a lot of directions. Like we really were back, like the gym started back in the back in the day. It was, it was a kung fu gym, really. Like that, that's the gym's base. And then, um, you know, sport kickboxing was very big in Australia in the 80s and 90s and, and Double Dragon produced a lot of kickboxers and people still, like, you know, some of the... the you know, uh, people that have been around the scene a long time do still think about gyms that kick boxing gym. Yep. But then, like, um, as it happens, like, Muay Thai, it started to emerge in Australia and really, I think, now he's the dominant form of stand-up fighting in Australia. I don't think K1's really... There still is a K1 team, but it's not not much going on there, really, I don't think. Um, so we sort of became, gradually over time, more of a Muay Thai gym. Like, we put... Like when we're a martial arts team, like they teach jiu-jitsu and stuff there, and they have a competitive, uh, presumed jiu-jitsu team. But our, yeah, we became uh, a Muay Thai school, and so Rowan fought full tie rules in his career, whereas um, Shane maybe didn't get as much opportunity there, because Shane, his focus has been coaching for a while, he just had a few fights and then moved on to coaching, so for him, he's just done such an excellent job of reaching out to learn how to really become... A Muay Thai gym. So like, and then I think me and um, uh, Luke Thompson, who is one of our like, yeah our most successful Muay Thai fighter over the last few years, we got involved and we just got stuck in and we really wanted to do it. And there was a few other young guys in at the moment in at that time as well, and we all started training up to fight together. And so we had like that was really a turning point where we became because we always had some fighters, but it'd be like one or two at a time. It wouldn't be like a busy, active team. Yeah. And there also wasn't the scene to do a busy, active team, really. Like, you didn't get opportunities. Yeah. Whereas, like, we were kind of just ready to go at a time where things started to get moving again. So we started doing... Me and Luke just became very close training partners because I think we had similar ethics. Like, we liked to do as much as we possibly could and we really pushed each other. Yeah. And then, as tends to be the case, most of the people that we started with dropped off because that's what happens some people just don't want to really go all in on it they just want to get it get a feel for it and stop so then it kind of became me and Luke and and we sort of started to get 
busier again, busier with it. Like, because a lot of the other fighters at that time were, we had other fighters, but they were maybe taking breaks. Like, a few were traveling and stuff like that. Yeah. So we sort of, and then our coach, um, Nick, our, our, the, the gym's original coach, kind of took both of us aside once, and, and I remember this and said, like, I think you guys can really take this as far as you want to take it. Mm-hmm. So really make this your life for a little while because you guys are still young and stuff like that. So have a big run, and that really made me think, like, yeah, I want to do this. I really want to do this as, as well as I can do it. And Luke was the same, and we just became really close training partners, and that's just just brothers now, <laughs> really. Like, um, yeah, love Luke. <laughs> like, we just... Really, think, dude, we just really pushed each other, and like we both. Oh, I hate holding. I hated holding pads for him because he's <laughs> ninety something kilos, but like had to do it. And then we just were busy. We spent like we both racked up about twenty fights in two years of amateur fighting, like because we just wanted to fight all the time. Yeah. And then Luke got to go over to uh, the world championships twice and medal twice. And now, um, at the Ifmas this year, he's actually screwed his knee really badly in the fight, like collapsed at the end. In the gold medal match, he fought it like he look. He actually did it in his first fight at the Ifmas. Like he blew his knee out fighting this um, big, big Argentinian. But won that fight, then had a day's rest, and like the knee just blew up, and he couldn't show any of the medics or anything because they would have pulled him. Yeah. And he went into the gold medal match against like this red hot American bloke, um, uh, Oscar Castro, I think his name is. And he's just hopping on one leg, just having a crack at it. <laughs> like you see him, like I think. If you don't know Luke, you think like, yeah, he went pretty well. It was just a good, honest fight and a close points loss. But when you know his style, you go like, ah, oh, something's up with that knee. And then the fight ended and they shook hands. And once he sort of tried to relax on his knee, he just fell down in the ring. So for the minute, that's it for um, we tie for him. But he's like an unreal boxer. Like he's just, he's been boxing. He's had, I think, like 10 boxing fights this year or something. Like, And he's really jumped right into fighting far more experienced guys in boxing and he can take boxing as far as he wants to take it. He's unreal. That's what I was just about to ask you. Yeah, he does boxing because he fought um, a guy that used to train out of Andy's gym, one of his first students, Christian Bowser. Yeah, Yeah, they fought twice. And Luke won twice, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, hard fights both of them, but yeah, Luke Luke got those things. Yeah, fought a few more experienced guys and then I think he can do whatever he wants to do in boxing, but he just has that mind where he can do whatever he wants to do in anything. Like, and that's why he was such a good training partner in Muay Thai. And he's still, like, he's training for his own boxing fights and, and, like, there was a bit of a time, you know, with him falling out and, like, there's been a little bit of a generational shift with our fighters, like, most of the guys that are in the gym are the newer guys. Um, maybe, like, like, there was a few weeks in this fight where I was a bit stuck for training partners. Mm. Like, because people had all just fought and we're away and things like that. So I was sort of just smashing the bag and studying pads and stuff like that, just doing what I could do. But then Luke still comes in and, and he holds pads for me and kicks at me and stuff like that, even though he's got his own boxing stuff going on. So like, Luke's just a teammate. Like He knows how to be a part of the team. He's in the gym, whether he's training for, him, for himself or he's helping out. And I think you need that in gyms. Like, that's such an important thing. Is like, like, I always believe, like, don't just train until your flight and then disappear for a while. Like, come yeah. back in and help your mates. Because what goes around comes around. Exactly right, man. Like, and it's even as well, like, like I had someone like I was over in the UK training for a little bit, like, just on holiday, not seriously. And I trained with a guy called um, Crew Bill Judd, who's quite well known over there. And, and he said to me, like, he let me train in his gym and taught me a lot. And he said, so much of um, what happens at your stage in your career is who's willing to open their door to you, who's willing to give you their time. And I reckon that's mm. like, that's really true. Like You have to be able to give people your time and your help and your assistance and stuff like that because then you get that back. I've been yeah. having that a lot now. Like I, I've been training, sort of cross-training a little bit with this guy. I've been going to um, Aram's gym at Situton. Okay. Oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Getting in there for a bit of sparring stuff. And like, he's been unreal. Like just... Yeah, come in, train, absolutely. He's taking me through pads and, and the boys there, Guy and Jordan and stuff like that. Like, I'm not, like, a member of their gym as such, like, I from another gym, but they let me come in and just just help me, really. Like, they're just trying to help me get ready for my fight, and that's been, like, awesome. Didn't um, Aaron just get... Oh, did I help yeah, me on this one? Yeah, the WBC is going to come that's... back to New South Wales and Aaron's going to be helping out with that. That's the one. So big congratulations to you there, Aaron. 
Yeah, good man for the job, Aaron. He's one of the good ones. So how many active fighters have you got at uh, Double Dragon at, at, as we speak? We've got a few. We've got, so, let me just count them. I think he's here. Man. We've probably got 10 to a dozen at varying levels. So we've got, I'm probably our most experienced fighter. Me and Luca are about neck and neck, but he's boxing now. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Dion is the next one. He's been fighting for a while, and, and he's in the gym. He's back in the gym now after... Like, when me and Luke started, like, Dion actually started before us, but he, he did some extended stints traveling, so he's kind of like my main training part now. He's yeah. uh, he's going to go pro pretty soon. Um, yeah, pretty soon, not sure exactly, but he's one to watch for sure. He's um, he shit to deal with in Spain. And then, like, from there, it's like we've got um, a couple guys sort of around that five fight kind of mark, so there's a little bit of a fall off there. And then we've got a bunch of guys that are just getting into it now. Yeah. So, like, yeah, like, we had a, a generation of guys that ended up sort of getting weeded down to, to just me and Luke that were really going out for a while. And now, I spend a lot of my time in the gym helping younger guys get, get into it, and that's where it comes to, like, you build your next set of training partners. And, and that's one of the good things about being at sort of a smart technical gym is people become good training partners very quickly because mm. they've got the, they're have got starting to get your eye for technique and stuff like that. And that's what, yeah, I'm been really impressed with some of our young guys and most of it, our young guys are a really good testament to how we have become a Muay Thai gym like yeah. we're not what people think maybe just a kickboxing school that jumps in tie rules like we really our coaching has like the last probably two generations of our fighters have been real Muay Thai fighters is what we want out of a Muay Thai program we're not a kickboxing school so we have a Muay Thai like we fight kickboxing if we have to but we if we fight in Muay Thai it's, it's real Muay Thai prefer Muay Thai, yeah. yeah. And you were telling me um, at the start that you run your own classes, you train, you also train people? Yeah, so, um, well, it's been a little while now, probably 18 months ago, we had a little shift with, I mean, the gym's getting busier and busier, like, you can barely fit everyone in that place some nights now. And um, Shane Ron just sort of came to me and said, you know, would you be interested in maybe taking over some of the team's classes? And like I said, yeah, straight away, but I was be like, oh, I don't know if I'd be any good at that. Like, I really didn't know if um, it was something. But they gave me, like, it was really good the way we did it because it wasn't like, do you want to help us out with the kids' classes? And then they weren't, like, over my shoulder trying. Look, just like when they bring up fighters, they want to just show you kind of a lot of things and you make your own style. Just they guide you. It's like, they weren't trying to make me just regurgitate their teaching. They were trying to just... You know, they helped me learn, but they really gave me that free reign to come up with how I wanted to teach them, and, and that was helpful because I don't. I think that made me develop. Like I can quite, I can confidently take a big class now, and I think people do. Well, I mean, they they at least tell me they do. I suppose they would tell me if they did and <laughs> enjoy my class and stuff like that. So take like my like the class that I am kind of that is mine is the teenage class. Like I'm those guys only coach. Like you know. We'll mix and match here and there, but on a consistent basis, it's just me. I take some adult classes, but just sort of a night a week type thing. So, a couple of my I take teenagers rather than kids. So I've got sort of fourteen to seventeen year olds, and two of my young guys are fighting on development days now. Yeah, it's like that interesting mix where I do teach guys from the start, and there's a mixed level as is the case with any kids class. But I think it's a good sign that. These kids still do the teenage classes with me, and they can go compete successfully off of that. And that, to me, tells me that what we're doing is working. That we just—it's pretty nuts and bolts stuff. I really believe in that. Like, you want to get better at kicking, throw a lot of kicks. Throw. You want to get better at knees, throw a lot of knees. You want to learn to clinch. Just try to clinch. Just like, it's not going to be great at first, but you've got to just get stuck in and do it. And that's sort of the basis of my teaching to them. Like, it's just. You know, I have a look, but I really just let them get their line hours up, their pads and their clinching and stuff like that. And, like, the kids have come along unbelievably, like, particularly, like, Kai and Chris, my competitive ones. Like, we had Kai on the other weekend. And this kid is slick. Like, he's never had a fight without the shin guards on yet, but, like, he's slick beyond his experience. Like, I really, he's one of those people that make you excited to coach. They make you want to teach them because they just... He picks things up really well, and he has this really beautiful Thai style. And um, 
Yeah, he just comes leaps and bounds, and he just loves to compete as well. He doesn't care. He's always back in the gym Monday after he fights. Wants to fight every five seconds. Hates when they make him fight my entire because I hate it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just like yeah. So just been getting stuck into the teaching. I love it, eh? So are you are you a full time fighter and teacher, or have you got like a day job as well? No, I, I was like so I'm still at uni doing commerce, and outside of that, I'm a storeman at a, at a trophy warehouse. So I just Cute. do kind of general pick and pack stuff, and then in the nights I split my time between teaching and training myself. Oh, mate, so you haven't got much time to play with. No, nah, but it's like, I, I, people do say that, but, like, teaching especially, like, like teaching and training, that is my, like, leisure time. Like, like so people say, like, oh, you, you're doing stuff all hours of the day, and it's like, yeah, but I go do stuff that I find really fun for, like, mm. three, four hours of the day. Like, that's the best way to live. And that's how, uh, that's how successful people are so successful because they're always out doing things as well. So yeah, I don't care that I don't get to come home and watch Netflix for three hours. Like, I don't care. I, I like to go home and I like <laughs> to go to the gym and just train uh, myself and train other people all hours. Then I just come home and sleep. See, that's yeah, <laughs> excellent, excellent. And mate, uh, you also, uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, you and a couple of the guys from your gym, uh, you run your uh, Enter the Double Dragon podcast. Yeah. T- tell us about that. How did that all originate? Uh, where did it, how the idea come and uh, Tell us about some of your guests and, and can you tell us about any upcoming episodes? Yeah, so basically, like, we just kind of lucked out because Shane's brother-in-law already had a podcast, like a history podcast. So there was just like a functional podcast studio just um, in their house that we could just jump in on and, and use. So that, like, sort of inspired Shane and, and, like, we all listen to a lot of fighting podcasts and, like, we all... You know, we know a bit about fighting for us, so we just, like, he broached the idea to us with Shane's idea, like, what if we did, like, a gym podcast that people would listen to, and, and I think, like, I never shut up, so I think, like, podcasting sort of suits, like, I, I watch a lot of fights, and I have a lot to say about it, and to me, I, like, what excited me about it was, I don't think enough media exists, in particularly in Thai boxing, and it's, mm. like, what's beneficial about what you do, interviewing people, it's... Like, one of the reasons that other, like, what people need to be able to do to really get invested in um, a sport, like Muay Thai, is they need to be able to hear perspectives on it and stuff like that. Like, that's what keeps people interested in other sports. Mm. But I think, like, like I, I listen to some MMA podcasts that I find interesting. Even though I don't even watch that much MMA anymore, I still listen to some of the podcasts. Yeah. And then that lets you get a little bit invested. And I found that there's nowhere cons- no consistent source somewhere that you can listen to and they'll do the results of the last Top King show and tell you what happened in the Thai stadiums here and there and give you something, things to watch out for in the next coming weeks and tell you what's up. Because it is a little bit of a hard sport to follow. Like, I follow it quite closely now just because of the things that I follow on Instagram and Facebook and things like that. And I know sort of where to look now and I watch a lot. But I think when you're just getting into it, you might know that you like Muay Thai but not know where to find it. So I think that's kind of like my role. is, And I do like kind of breakdowns, like, like, let people go, oh, this fight happened in Raja Stadium. You know, if you watch it, watch for, you know, the way that this set up and things like that. Give people a different way to look at it. And I think we have a good balance on the podcast in that we have me and, um, like, the owner-operator, the Jim Shane, but also um, Trenton, who's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. So you've got, like, we can talk about Muay Thai and then we can talk about what's going on in Jiu-Jitsu, which is kind of a similar thing to Muay Thai, like, maybe doesn't have that mainstream quote bigger than Muay Thai but doesn't have the like mainstream following and then if we want to just there's something interesting going on in MMA we can kind of share perspectives on that we've got to be the like Jiu Jitsu experience and Muay Thai experience and then just but I think for the most part it's just like we just talk about what interests us and that's where it comes to like we don't like if there's a boring UFC on we don't force ourselves like we just go alright results for this show we didn't watch it <laughs> <Let's move laughs> yeah. on, like, like we're not just going to like we're not trying to beat every other podcast. We just want to make something that I think really what you have to think about when you do anything like that is who's your audience and don't think too big. For us, yeah. straight away, it's it's our gym. That's who who we're into. And then wider than that, it's the industry. So that's mm-hmm. why we started. Like we had Andrew on, um, just to talk about his shows and stuff like that. And we had Ian Schaefer, who actually fought out of our gym and he fought up Genki Sudo in, in K1 in the K1 Max heyday. He came on and had a chat and. 
things like that. And actually, Gustavo, as soon as um, we wrap up, I'm going to talk to Lewis Regis about oh, yeah. his upcoming fight with Yod St. Clair, which I think will be awesome. Yeah. So, like, yeah, it's like, we didn't, we're not trying to be bigger than we are. We're just trying, like, really, we're still trying to get the hang of it. Like, none of us know anything about making a podcast. It's a miracle that we even get it online sometimes. <laughs> like, but <laughs> we have the means to do it. And I think, like, same thing as my teaching. No one tells me that, actually. Like, like, people say, like, I'll go to a gym to spar and, and someone will go, yeah, I listen to your podcast, man. I thought this part was really good. It tells me they actually listen. So, like, just trying to just gradually get it out there and, and make something that, like, even if just a few people in the New South Wales or Australian combat sports team listen to it, then just a source of media. And then from there, it becomes something that can be a platform. Someone can reach out to us and say, I've got a show coming up. Can I can yeah. I use this as a vehicle to, to talk about it? And then they can promote it from there as well. So it kind of, it, it's it's mutually beneficial, I think. Yeah, I've had that, like, not heaps, but yeah, I've had a couple of times where someone would be like, oh, can I can I do an interview with you? I'm like, what? You actually listen? Like, really? Yeah, so I just think it's just that, you know, just giving Muay Thai voice is one of the most important things to grow it because it can be a hard sport to follow and you just need to have the right, you know, actual educated minds delivering further information. It's in, Education is everything and that's what podcasts are really is as much as they're just opinion and things like that is they're a source of education and like, the people in the gym have really started to like it. Like they'll listen to it and then they'll hear a fight I talk about and they'll go watch it and then like that's kinda of how you make someone into a bit more of a fan. Like you just show them where to find the good fights and like we'll put all the fights we talk about in the show notes and stuff so it can become like a week's worth of fights for you to watch. Yeah, definitely mate, definitely. They've been enjoying um, doing it for sure. It's something different for me and try to been... listen back and figure out how to do it better and stuff. It's been, I, it's been pretty, pretty fun for me, man. Like I, I can honestly say that everyone I've had, like everyone's been like really good, and it's been really fun. I, I have get, I do get like a couple of people from around the world be like, oh, can I have an interview? And I like, I, I look them up, and I'm just like, who the hell are you? Like, <laughs> I get, and you look, you watch some of their videos, and they're like, oh, I'm a crew. Well, first of all, you're white, you're not Thai, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and you see them hitting pads, or you see them doing things, and it's just like. Uh, maybe not. I just might not reply to that one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, before I, before I let you go, um, tonight uh, predictions for power play. Oh, uh, good card actually. Like it comes back to like the same thing about uh, like power play is the kickboxing show, but the cards majority full tie rules, so that kind of mm. tells you where. Like you know, no knock on. I like good kickboxing, but like I just think like Muay Thai's kind of become like overtaken it within a show. I think. You can't pick against Toby. Like, yeah. you, like Toby versus Brad Riddell would have been a really good fight. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's just not how it goes. You know, get unlucky sometimes. I think Toby's got a bit of smart money here. I, look, I admittedly haven't seen heaps of his opponent, um, but I believe he's been more of an MMA fighter. Which, and look, about to, it's, I don't think Toby's had a quite shorter opponent for a while so I think Toby's yeah. just going to grab his neck mate and yank him yeah I think could be like I'd, I'd like towards a stoppage win for Toby he's just been on fire and like it's, it's his rules things like that um I know Chris Bradford got a late replacement um Joe Bouvier Joe Bouvier yeah um not really sure like you want to lean towards the guy who didn't take it on one day's notice but um <laughs> Joe's pretty skillful I think yeah. that's going to be an interesting fight. Like, I was really confused about that Chris Bradford fight. Like, he was fighting a tie at 95 kilos. Like, <laughs> yeah, that was crazy to me. But, um, yeah, maybe lean towards Bradford just on the basis that, you know, he had a training camp for it, full training camp. He's a special okay. name, Chris Bradford. I think, I think uh, uh, watching his... Um, here we go. Reverb again. I think uh, watching his... Um, posts on Instagram, he looks pretty fired up and it's just going to come forward, I think. Yeah, another good one on that card is um, Quan Trini fighting Albert Xavier. That's a good match. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that match. Um, I don't have the card in front of you, but I'm also pretty sure Joseph Coverdale is fighting, who I've watched on the, the Melbourne scene a bit, and, and, and he's like a real up-and-comer. He's quite good. So, oh, as I do, I'll be watching that. I'll be getting the stream. So, <laughs> what what time does that start? Oh, seven or so, I think. Seven, seven, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, what's seven, 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 se
um, get more info about your gym uh, or uh, listen to your podcast? Give us your uh, your platforms. Uh, so probably, uh, you know, you can get the gym. It's at Double Dragon Gym on um, Instagram, Double Dragon Martial Arts Gym, Facebook. There, that will probably serve as your, uh, you know, way to find everything else. The gym, the podcast is on Instagram too, um, at End of the Double Dragon. So if you get to Double Dragon Gym, you'll probably find it through there. You can search it. Um, if you want to find me on Instagram, I'm there as well as Hugh O'Donnell. Um, the podcast is also just, if you just want to get at it straight away, it's, it's everywhere. It's iTunes, it's Spotify. If you use one of the third-party podcasts, that's Podcast Addict, CastBox, Google Play Podcast, pretty much anywhere that you can find podcasts, you can find us. So just search uh, into the Double Dragon and you'll get us. We do an episode, we like to say we do one every week and sometimes we actually do. So like, the episodes are yeah. pretty, pretty regular and you'll you'll get like a wrap-up of what's been going on locally in Muay Thai and kickboxing, a um, bit more breakdowns of what's been going on around the world, and then, you know, a bit of, um, you know, talk jiu-jitsu and a bit of just wider combat sports as well, boxing and MMA. So, um, if there's anything you, if you are in the market for a new <laughs> Muay Thai podcast or any kind of combat sports podcast, think about chucking us a listen. And if there's anything you want to hear discussed or anyone you want to hear interviewed and things like that, um, get at us on Instagram and let us know because we're really looking for ways that we can give people what they want to hear and stuff like that. So... I think a great starting point this week will be an interview with um, Lewis Regis. I think that should be a really good episode. I'm really excited to go chat to him. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's us. Uh, Enter the Double Dragon. And, mate, uh, last but not least, anyone you want to thank or give a shout-out to? Um, of course, I want to thank my gym, Double Dragon Martial Arts. My coaches, Shane Rowan and Mick, who really have given me everything, really. Like, I can't... Like, how grateful I am to them for just what they've done for me in my life is... Like, that's why I, really I give so much I try to give everything I can back to the gym as far as helping out with coaching and development days and things like that because like my life is Muay Thai and that was my introduction through the gym that gave me like what Rowan and Mick and Shane have taught me just in Muay Thai but what spreads to life and <laughs> things like that I think yeah. it's just been a massive influence for me that really made me who I am like as pushy as it probably sounds it's true like I often think about just how grateful I am to them or that what having them in my life done for me. Thank you also, um, uh, the Sitsuton, Aaron, Gay, and Jordan, and all the boys at Sitsuton who have helped me out getting ready for my last couple of fights. Made a massive difference, and I'm looking forward to doing more with them coming into next year. I think it's going to be huge. And also got to say thank you to my um, sponsor as well, the Friend in Hand Hotel in Glebe, who have given me some really generous support my last couple of fights, and yeah, really creating opportunities for me by just believing in me, really. Um, same with my family. My family just believe in me and back me like my mum's been awesome and stuff like that and it's in a good environment awesome man well uh best oh is there going to be a live stream for the roots show next week i think i read that there was no live stream for this one all right yeah so maybe that's unfortunate they glued to the the rebellion Muay Thai youtube channel because they're pretty busy nice one si thanks a lot the man <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. Well, uh, cheers for your time, man, and good luck for your fight next week. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me on. Appreciate it. Cheers, bro. The lives of great warriors, revered and notorious. Infamous and legendary, that to me is glorious. Come kick it, still talk some shit with me. I'll ask so you can answer and explain to me the history. I had to throw a vicious knee. I got a passion for the heart of eight limbs. I'm just asking from the heart. So as I conclude this interview, thanks so much for sitting through. Loved all the fighters and the folks that listen. This for you.